I'm going to read just one of those scriptures, Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3, though I'm going to be making reference to excerpts from both 1 Samuel 17 and Ephesians 6. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word that we will soon hear. We thank you that your word is like a sword that pierces. It is like a scalpel that brings a healing ultimately to a sick body. And we thank you that your word has survived all these years. Now I pray, Lord, that the spoken word would be anointed by your Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill this sanctuary. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I'm going to repeat that last phrase. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. A minister went down a little side street near a passing a newspaper and a cigar store where he saw an old man, homeless, lounging out front. Feeling compassion, the clergyman pressed $20 into his hand and said, don't despair. The next day when the minister came by, the old man was there again. He waved a handful of money at the minister and said, here's your $400. The minister asked, what do you mean by that? Well, yesterday you told me to put $20 on Don't Despair in the fourth race at Santa Anita, and it paid off 20 to 1. <laughs> now, today's sermon has nothing to do with horses or racing or betting. But it does have something to do with human nature and with winning. That is, of living a victorious life by learning how to live without defensive armor. Whose armor are you wearing? All of us in this sanctuary are intelligent, sensitive, and I must say we are very bright people. Or as Garrison Keeler would say of our parents, they all had children who were above average. So here we are this morning, all of us above average. In spite of all that, I think it is also safe to say that most of us sometimes, maybe more often than we want to admit, are insensitive to the feelings of others. Let me say that carefully. Sometimes we say and do things that hurt other people without knowing it. And they say things without knowing how their words affect us. Ever happened to you? I'm guilty. When that happens, when we feel hurt and sorry for ourselves, we react or recoil with our very defensiveness and it drives people away from us. And for guys especially, we withdraw, give the person who hurt us the old silent treatment. And so tension and estrangement build up and personal relationships are damaged. It happens in marriages. It happens among families and relatives. It happens between colleagues at work. It happens in the church. 
Most of us are more thin-skinned than we like to admit. And then in the process we feel we need protection, and so we develop defensive shields and helmets and other weaponry of advice from people that we begin to hide and protect ourselves, and the more that happens, the more frantically we try to discover ourselves, and the result is that in all our protectiveness we overreact, we become very defensive, and we begin to live for trivia. We reach out for anything and everything. We avoid dealing with the real issues. We withdraw from folks who have hurt us, and then we wonder why we have an identity crisis. You think we would learn from all of this? So what I want to say this morning is that our true identity ultimately is found only by allowing Jesus Christ to become the center of our lives. If you remember nothing else from this sermon, remember this first point. The source of our identity is Jesus Christ. To follow him, to become more and more like him, and in the strength of that discovery, we begin to live a victorious life by learning how to live our lives without self-imposed armor. I believe God has created us to live lives that have integrity. I believe we can live lives in our homes and here at church and in our businesses where we can be open and vulnerable and real and transparent and trusting and not always defensive. I believe when we live that way, we will grow as a church. We will have healthier marriages. We will model a balanced and healthy environment for our children and others who are watching us, maybe without our even being aware. And it's not easy. Indeed, I believe the life need of communities and the nation is how to learn how to live without carrying a heavy defensive load of armor as Goliath did in the Old Testament story. I hope you'll read again this great story in the 17th chapter of the, of the book of Samuel, of 1 Samuel. When my two sons and I were growing up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, I would read to them to sleep every night. And if Christopher were here this morning, he would say that sometimes I fell asleep before they did. When they were little, they slept in bunk beds with Stuart up on top and Christopher on the bottom. And some of their favorite stories were Tom Sawyer, C.S. Lewis's The Adventures of Narnia. I love to read them the great stories of the Old Testament. And among them all, the story of David and Goliath was their all-time favorite. I must have read it to them 40 times. So when Michael Smith read the story of David and Goliath for family devotions last week, I decided to preach a sermon on that classic story. It's too good of a story not to tell it again in brief. The armies of Israel and Philistia were on opposite sides of the Valley of Elah, and they were taunting and defying each other. And as you know from a study of transactional analysis, there is always a top dog and an underdog. Unfortunately, at this time, the Philistines were the top dogs, and the poor Israelites were the underdogs. And if you see the battle of the Valley of Elah up there, the Israelites were on the northern, the Philistines were on the southern side of this valley. Day after day, the ritual fashion, they would confront each other. The giant Goliath would say, don't you have any men who have the courage to come out and fight me? And the Israelis would go back to their tents, discouraged, angry with themselves. No one was brave enough to fight him. And just like in the days of the war between the states in the 1860s in our country, families sent food to the soldiers in the middle of their battlefield. If you wanted your sons to have enough to eat, 
You sent him food from your own supplies. The government didn't provide it. So Jesse, with three of his oldest sons in the army on the front line, sent his youngest, a little boy, David, who was in high school and a shepherd, gave him some corn and bread and cheese for his brothers. And if you read the Bible in the light of what you know about human nature and the political process, you will notice that the Bible says that Jesse sent 10 special cheeses. They were from Philadelphia, Philadelphia cream cheeses. <laughs> so that the, and gave them to the captain, which was a careful way to make sure the food David took actually got to the three brothers. It's hidden in that story. It's wonderful. As well... They gave the cheeses, Philadelphia cream cheeses, to the captain. It was the father's wise effort to ensure good treatment by the captain to his sons. The story is here in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. I encourage you to read it today in the afternoon while it's raining. It'll be a good time to cozy up, cozy up in a little by the fireplace and read this wonderful story. David obeyed his father, and he went to the, where the battle was taking place, and he gave the cheeses to the captain. He then asked for permission to speak to his brothers, and just like typical older brothers, they said to David, what in the world are you doing here? Go back home where you belong. Take care of the sheep. But David, with his own sense of integrity, said, what's going on here? Everybody is so depressed. Why are you afraid of that giant over there on the other side of the valley who is insulting the God of Israel and the army? Don't despair. That's the connection with the opening story. Why don't you go get him? And they looked at him and said, you're just a little boy. You don't understand things. Go home. If you want to read a fascinating paperback on the story of David, which is better than a hundred TV shows. Maybe I could say more than a hundred because there's not much to watch on television anymore. Let me recommend the book Out of the Miry Clay by John Herkus, a British physician whose insight into human character brings the time and person of David to life. It's a wonderful book. It's published by InterVarsity Press. And so David who was wise in the f ways of the fields and wildness and the wilderness as a shepherd said that he once had killed a bear and a lion. He had known hand-to-hand -hand combat and caring for his sheep in the dead cold of the night. So he said, I'll go out and fight Goliath. We're fighting for a cause. This man is defying the very God of Israel. I'll go out in his name, I'm not afraid. So they sent word to King Saul in his tent that there was a young man ready and willing to fight Goliath. Bring him in, Saul growled. What makes you think you can overcome Goliath? He's over nine feet tall. David said, I will go in God's strength and in my own experience. And then King Saul said, take my armor for your own defense. Now that's the point in the story I want you to remember. It's here in 1 Samuel 17, verses 38 to 40. They brought out Saul's armor and put it on David's shoulders and gave him a large sword which he strapped on his side. And after a short while, David said, I can't fight in this armor. It doesn't fit. I've got to go as I am in my simplicity, in my own experience and confidence, and in my trust in God. I've got to be myself, nobody else. And so he shed the armor and went forth to meet Goliath, who shrieked and cursed, Am I a dog that you are coming out to me with sticks in your hand? And I read an interesting account just uh, earlier this week. It's actually a, it's a book called David and Goliath, um, and it's by an American um, or maybe a British uh, author who said that the strain of giants among the Philistines often came with physical disabilities, and sometimes they would see double. 
they had problems with their eyes because they were growing so fast, the, the rest of their body didn't catch up to them. This is how he explained how there's this one verse where Saul says, why do you come to me with sticks? And he really only had one staff. The scripture says he had his staff and his sling, and he picked up five, five smooth stones. I don't know, that may be an interesting little insight. Um, and then maybe that's also why Goliath kept saying to him, come and get me, come and get me. I want to see you closer. I want to see, what, are there two of you or just one of you? And you don't have to remember any of that, okay? <laughs> <coughs> so you know what David did. He put a stone in his sling and aimed for the giant's forehead. Traveling at more than 200 feet per second, the stone slammed into Goliath's skull with something like 5,000 pounds of energy. He fell and crashed with the thunder of brass and iron that echoed from the walls of the ravine, and David cut off his head. What is the point? You can't fight the issues in life with someone else's armor. You can't. It will prove a burden and will ultimately destroy you. And as I said at the beginning of the sermon, to learn to live with someone else's armor applies to individuals, to families, to businesses, to churches, even the international system of states. People say, nobody is going to hurt me. I'll be tough as nails. I've got thick skin, but we drive our friends away. The more we are hurt, the more armor we put on. Eventually, our defensiveness attracts attack, and our fear becomes our ultimate defeat. There was Goliath with armor and helmet, spear and sword, and with shield bearer, and everything going for him, the top dog. But the very armament that he carried to defend himself enabled David with his freedom of movement, his flexibility of action, the naturalness and simplicity of his own experience, and his trust and belief in God that enabled him to conquer the giant with a slingshot. The courage of his stout heart leading him, David was able to find the one vulnerable spot in Goliath's armor and to defeat him with a stone to the frontal bone of his head. Now let me give you an example at the international level. The United States spends billions of dollars on defense Every thinking man and woman says, you certainly know we must have some form of defense. And it's true, but always in history, the static, heavy armor of the past becomes the ultimate defeat because the dynamics of human life in a providential history are such that the victory always goes to those who are simple and creative and flexible rather than to those who hide behind heavy armors of defensiveness that they've become used to. The American Revolutionary Army, with their camouflage coats and guerrilla tactics, defeated the British redcoats who marched in straight lines. In the unfortunate aftermath of World War I, many European friends settled down behind concrete and steel barriers. However, in World War II, the fluid forces of history and of the inventions of new arms went around and beyond them, and today the Maginot line of defense is something only for sightseers to see in France, to look at. It was an armor of past defense that didn't hold. Please don't under, uh, misunderstand me. I'm not saying the United States shouldn't have a strong army, and all, but we need to update it all the time. We need to keep reinvesting in it if we're going to help to police the world, which is full of sin and brokenness. The same is true in business. The business that can't swing with the tide of change gets hurt. The business that doesn't adapt to change, that relies on one single product or a way of production that doesn't diversify, that doesn't reach new markets, will lose out. The same is true of churches. 
The congregation that cannot adapt and change will be defeated by its own cumbersome armor of tradition and the past that says, we've never done it that way before. We can't wear someone else's armor. An individual who says, if I close my eyes and clench my fists earnestly enough, the danger will go away, will find that it usually doesn't go away. You and I may be carrying other people's armor that may have served them well, but we can't wear it comfortably any more than David could wear Saul's armor. We need to face life in our own place and time and use the strength God has given us. Five smooth stones from the brook. And notice you can't stockpile that weapon very much. Like David, you just pick them up as a resource right where you are. David had a shepherd's staff which served to rescue a sheep or to help him over shimmering shale as he scrambled out of a gully to feed the ship, sheep. It was a stave which he could drive off a wolf or a fox and it represented his integrity. The same is true of your faith. Your heritage was good for those who gave it to you, but your parents' faith won't do you any good until you remake it as your very own possession. In other words, you can't wear someone else's army. Your faith in Christ must be yours, not someone else's. The creedal statements we use were great for the men and women of, the, uh, of a former day, and it's important to be reminded of that. But you and I have to proclaim the truth in our own language. You have to find the Christ of your own experience. Yes, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but you are different, and times have changed. The commitment you and I have made as a child to Christ has to be renewed daily in the context of the decisions we now need to make on the job, in the home, and how you share your resources. The person who wears someone else's armor does so in proportion to his or her fear. The strong person does not wear it in proportion to his or her faith and confidence. I recently read an account of a naturalist who was spending some time at a camp in the woods. One day he heard a bumping noise and looked across the field to its source and there was an unfortunate skunk with his head caught in a mayonnaise jar left over by a careless tourist at a campsite. I hunted desperately for a picture of that. This was the closest I came up with. The poor skunk was going along the wall, bopping the jar against the stones, trying to get out of it. Any prudent Presbyterian with his firm belief in predestination knows better than to engage in rescue work with a skunk whose head is caught in a mayonnaise jar. That is the defensive armor we have been trained to put on. But this brave naturalist said, Jimmy Skunk is a gentleman. And talking quietly, he reached out his hand slowly and said, I can help you, Mr. Skunk. Don't be afraid. And almost sensing the skunk's reactions, he took hold of the jar and said, Now, Jimmy, I'll pull and you pull back. In confidence, he reached over the skunk's neck and shoulder and gave that little extra pull necessary to release him. The skunk shook his head, took a breath, and went away placidly with dignity. And that cooperation can apply to human nature too. How often you and I play the game that Eric Byrne talked about in his classic book, Games People Play, especially the one called Kick Me. You remember that? We ask for it by the very armor that we wear. By the message of our defiance, we stir up aggression in other people. And one of our mutual fears, we defeat each other. And out of that, we limit our growth as persons. Having said all this, let me in conclusion suggest to you six principles or admonitions that will help you engage fully in life without self-imposed armor, without the heavy bulwark of unnecessary defense structures. 
They're based on the lesson from the book of Samuel and from the book of Hebrews from our New Testament lesson. The first of this is be yourself. The world says to be a success, you must wear our helmet. You must wear our breastplate. You must carry our sword and fight battles the way we fight. Everybody does it, Joe. But the message of the gospel is that you can be your own true self because God loves you. Regardless of your past or who you think you are, God loves you. His armor is what you should wear. His armor. Our contemporary attitude and fashion of the day tends to flatten and diminish people and their potential. We say to each other, you're too old, you're too young, you are a man, you are a woman, you are not qualified. We squeeze everyone into a mold of categories or labels like numbered parts in a tool room bin. But the liberating word of the gospel says that you are unique. You have value. You have potential. In Christ there is no master or slave, no male or female. You are one with him. In Christ your own gifts and individuality and uniqueness have a place. All the inventions from the light bulb to the computer were developed by people who were individualists, who had a vision and fulfilled it. You are beautiful, so be yourself. You can't wear someone else's armor. Secondly, an internalized spirit always overcomes an externalized spirit. What do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. David, who had a purpose in his heart, said, I'm fighting for God, and I'm living for God. A person like that is much stronger than the one that says, well, I'm doing this for the company, or I'm doing it because it's my job. The successful Christian marriage has an internalized spirit in which the commitment to each other goes way beyond duty or ceremony or we'll stay together for the kids. The person with an inner spirit and attitude of trust will always conquer the person who merely works mechanically. Thirdly, Faith in Jesus Christ influences and sustains a person by intuitive power and insight. I really believe that. I believe the right thing to say comes to a man or a woman who prays for it. I think prayer is so critical in our life. It is one of the best defensive weapons we have. There is a right moment to knock on a door, a right moment to visit a hospital to telephone or even send an email or a text. There is a right moment to put out the hand and risk being slapped down. In the risking, a man gives his integrity, his insight, his individuality. This is what David did when he confronted mighty Goliath who had everybody else afraid. Fourthly, and I'm going to quote from a rugged individualist, Andrew Jackson, who said, one person with courage makes a majority. One person can change a group consensus. I read some time ago about Mr. Gail Borden who discovered the process for making evaporated milk. He got his financing from a Presbyterian who lived in New York City, a Mr. Jeremiah Milbank, because he was a dedicated man who had a new idea for food condensing and preservation. The group consensus was that milk was a perishable food but Borden developed a breakthrough and put everything he had and owned into this risk. His intensity was like David's, so that a group of New York financiers backed the whole Borden enterprise, and he became very successful. It was Paul who said, I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. Now, friends, I know some of you sit on boards and governing councils, here in the community or in your business or organization? When was the last time you spoke out with your convictions, stood up for what you know to be right, and helped to change the group consensus away from an unethical or illegal act? You too can still change life if you will learn how to live without self-imposed armor. Self-imposed armor is always the means of your defeat, not the means of your victory 
nationally, corporately, in the family, or personally. Fifthly, put on God's armor. That's the armor that truly protects us. It's not from your own invention. It's not your armor that you have created. It's not based on your insecurities. It is based on what only God can provide. It's from Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18 and a little bit beyond. It includes the shield of faith. Faith is being sure that God will keep his promises. Faith in God protects you when you are tempted to doubt. It includes the helmet of salvation. You put on the helmet of salvation by believing that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again. The breastplate of righteousness is being honest and good and humble and fair to others. It means standing up for weaker people. The belt of truth keeps you from giving in to the world's beliefs and worldview. We always need to compare our beliefs and actions to the truth of the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. God's Word is always our offensive weapon. When we tell others what the Bible says, the Holy Spirit helps people see their bad thoughts and their bad actions and makes them want to be forgiven. And lastly are the sandals on the feet as the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace is when you are being right with God and being contented in troubled times. Jesus said the peacemakers will be blessed. And the sixth point is this. When you are wearing armor, God's armor, you will learn to trust people. It was the Italian statesman Count de Cavour who said, the person who trusts others makes fewer mistakes. Let me say that again. The person who trusts others makes fewer mistakes. Why? Because he or she is open. They are vulnerable, but they have integrity. They know where their strength comes from. He knows who he is. She knows who she is. He knows what he wants. She knows how the slings and arrows will come at her. She even expects them. But she's not filled with deceit or with duplicity or with uncertainty or fear. The person who trusts others makes fewer mistakes. He or she or you or I can do it because we trust God. The man who feels inferior and in and inadequate is usually a man who can't trust other people because he's so wrapped up in his own armor and defensiveness. Trusting others is always a risk worth taking. Either way, if you trust, you might get hurt. But if you do not trust, you are going to get hurt for certain. And the odds are in favor of trusting other people, their motives, their errors, their intentions. In the long run, it'll be better for you. You see, most people want rock of Gibraltar Presbyterianism, you know. We thank God, the Lord, that nothing ever changes here. But all of life changes. You have to learn to trust. Goliath believed that nothing ever changes. He was secure in his conventional armor. He didn't understand a little shepherd's slingshot could pierce so powerfully. He dared to shout, come out and fight me. And the Living Bible says that this red-cheeked kid, David, went out in the confidence of God to fight Goliath and conquered him. The practical conclusion is this. Use the strength that you have, the five smooth stones and the staff in your hand you have enough strength to live in today's battle. With God being your helper, don't wear someone else's armor. Wear God's armor. Re-examine your inner life as you serve the Lord in this church and allow the person of Jesus Christ to become the center of your identity. It's when Jesus is at the center of your life and you are filled with his Holy Spirit. That's God's armor described in Ephesians 6, becomes your protection and your true defense. So what armor are you wearing? 
Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this wonderful little story of David. Powerful story, as so many of the stories in the Old Testament are. I thank you that he had a heart for you. He knew how to confess when he knew he had done wrong. And you are a compassionate and loving God who always forgives. You are our best friend, and we can trust in you. So bless this congregation. Bless each one of us, Lord. Help us to follow you, even as David followed you before you came. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.